Well, first of all, thank you guys for, for coming this morning. I know the Broncos don't play the six, so we have some time in between to enjoy lunch, right? Um, uh, thank to, to Pastor Jeff and uh, Lori for uh, just welcome, welcoming my wife and I, Jen, into your church and just uh, the wonderful legacy that you have here and uh, uh, the people who love the Lord and just all of the friends we've met. Um, I want to recap where we've been. Uh, we've been going through the book of Jonah, and Pastor Jeff has, has walked us through uh, chapter 1, uh, in, in fact, Jonah 1 through 5, here I am, Lord, send someone else. I don't know if you have your notes from that. Um, we also went through chapter 1, 6 through 17, you can run, but you can't hide. And chapter 2 last week, which was part 3, we are Jonah. And so um, before we go into Jonah chapter 3, I kind of wanted to elaborate a little bit and, and before I elaborate, I'd like us to pray. So we ask the Father to, to come and bless the word. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your word. That's your word. It's not my word. Uh, we thank you for all of the wonderful people and saints who serve you and who continue to build the River Church up. We just ask you to be here and your presence be on the message today. In your precious name, amen. Okay. So I was... I was uh, Going over some of the notes uh, that Pastor Jeff let me uh, dig into to, to see how his mind works, and uh, it, it's, it's pretty cool. You know, he has a, a lot of stuff and a lot of stuff to sift through. And uh, as I read through Jonah, I started to think a little bit more about what the passage meets, means to me. And, and obviously, we, we know, hey, this whale swallowed Jonah. He got thrown over the boat. But I, as I started to pray on it and, and think about it a little more, I started to think about why wouldn't Jonah go on his call? Was it just because he had better things to do? Did he want to catch the ship and go, go on a, you know, a, a voyage, go on vacation? Or, or could it be that perhaps maybe he didn't agree with the message? Maybe he was a bit bitter. Maybe things didn't work out for him in, in some of the things he was doing before, spreading God's message. He says, hey, I'm out of here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go catch this ship and God, I'm, I'm done. I'm done with this. I don't know. Perhaps Jonah was so bitter that even the whale spit him out because he didn't taste very good, right? I think about that in my own life as I've walked and, and, and as I've come to know the Lord and uh, kind of had the, the pre-walking pre with Christ to the time that I walked with Christ. And even in the time that I walked with the Lord, things didn't always go so great. In fact, they even get tougher. It's like, gosh, all these, these, these issues and these obstacles and these problems, you can kind of get bitter. And we get bitter, and it, what starts to happen is we start to create the boats we're in. You can see how I, I, I try to match that using a boat. You know? So the boats we're in, right? And sometimes the boats we create because we're so bitter or we're running from our call cause people to throw us under the bus. Or throw us over the ship. I don't know if that, 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 that rings for you, but I can tell you for me that rings true. That it's at the time when I'm, I'm, I'm grateful and I'm, I'm just pleased that the Lord even asked me to play keyboards or asked me to speak today that he shows up. But it's at the times when I'm, I, I, I want to do it this way. Maybe I want to change the message a little bit. You know, God, I don't really want to tell him, them about like hell. <laughs> because th that's not fun, God. They're, how are they going to come to you if, they, you know, they're going to think I'm being preachy. They're going to think I'm preaching fire and brimstone. I, I don't want that. And so as, as we go into Jonah chapter 3 today, let, let's think about a bit where we're at. And perhaps let's say that you've grown bitter because maybe you've done some things in your life that are not so great. And maybe we're embarrassed they are not, they're not going to listen to me because you know. In fact, there's probably people who say, you know, there he is. You know, Jonah, he used to be in a whale, right? You know, he used to be in a whale. Don't listen to him. He was in there for three days. Yeah, guy, guy, guy got out, and now he's out here trying to preach the word. Should have never got caught in that whale. Should have never got caught in that sin. But the truth is, is that we're all sinners, maybe different degrees, in the Bible, it says that we're all filthy rags compared to the righteousness of God. So as we go through the, the scripture here today, we're going to see how 
Jonah's message actually was not just for the people. It was for the kings. It was for the teachers. It was for everybody across the board. God calls us out. Do we answer the call? Put the, that would be the first thing we're going to do. God calls us out. Do we answer the call? Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Well, a couple words that pop out to me is that a second time. God is a God of second chances. He's a God of third and fourth and fifth and infinite chances. And you know why God is a God of infinite chances? Because he is infinite. He is not constricted to time. The only obstacle in that message for us is that we are. We're restricted to time. And so what happens is after two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight chances, we run out of time because we get old, right? We, get, we grow older. Or let's say even that with people. You know, your brother gives you a second chance. You know, I, I, bro, I know you didn't mean to do that. Love you. Hey, sis, I didn't do, mean to do that to you. Oh, you know, third chance, love you. Hey, I know, gosh, I know, I, I did it again. Fourth time, love you. But what happens with people? We fall out of their grace, right? And that, that's what happens when we're in different boats and different, in different churches or maybe different jobs or maybe different relationships that we use up the grace that people give us. But isn't it wonderful that we have a wonderful God that never, ever gives up on us? He is a good, good father. And that's what's in the message he wanted to give to Jonah. Not that he wanted to go to Nineveh to say, hey, you sinners, get it together because I'm going to destroy this place. He's like, no, I love them. Go send this message to let them know what they're doing is going to destroy them. But I love them so much that I want to offer them a second chance. Amen? So Jonah obeyed. Finally, Jonah obeyed the Lord, right? And what does it mean to obey? I think sometimes the word in the English language, like, and I, I could speak for myself, obey reminds me if you have a dog. Sit, you boo, sit. Don't move. So when we tell us to obey, it's like, I'm not a dog. I don't have to obey for it. But could it be stay put? Don't move. Stop moving around because I have something I want to give you that I want you to give out. And you keep moving around and you keep going over here and you keep going to that church and you keep going to that boat and you keep going through all these relationships. But if you would have just stood where you're at, I had something I gave you. But this is the thing. Pastor Jeff said, I have a flyer for you today. It's probably not for you, but it's for somebody. But could you imagine if one of us grabbed a flyer and said, Harvest Festival, I think it should say Autumn Festival, personally, and go home and rescan it and redo the, the flyer, right? No, he gives it to us to deliver a message. Same thing with the Lord. The Lord has a message that he wanted to give Jonah. So Jonah obeyed, he stood still, and he went into the city of Nineveh. The message I give you, not the message that we design together. It's God's message. It's God's message of redemption. The city, it took three days to go through. What happens if you, if you go through a city? What could happen? I live downtown. My wife and I live in, in uh, Lodo, and we call ourselves, well, she calls us this. I'm going to agree with her, the grandparents of downtown, because of all the millennials, we're like the oldest walking around. And, you know, I'll tell you what, from going from our apartment to go downtown to get some lunch, you can get yourself into a lot of things. That's the truth. Pubs, you know, there's dispensaries down there. There's Rockies games. You know, think about the, the average person who's just walking through downtown. If it took maybe two hours to go through downtown. Well, let's say if I had a message that I had to deliver, I can get caught up smelling the roses, right? I can get caught up hanging out at the Rockies game too long. I could get caught up hanging out at a pub and not get to the task at hand. So the thing in chapter one that is do we answer the call or do we get caught up in the things that we have to do first? God, I got you, but let me take care of this first. Okay, God, thank you. Okay, God, I love you. But first, let, uh, I'm going to go visit with some friends. Or do we answer the call? All right. Let's go to, to chapter 2. All right. 
the, the second point, God gives us the message, do we carry it out? Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on a sackcloth. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on a sackcloth. Jonah began going out on his journey, going through the city. Maybe he's going through Denver, right? Maybe he's going through a, a, a bigger city. And he was on a mission for God. He went through the city. He didn't stop to smell the roses. He didn't get lost along the way. He went and he had a message. You know, it's like, have you seen the, the bicycles? They have, uh, they're riding, they have the messaging thing, and they go and they deliver their, their, their mail. They have a message, but it's not their message. It's, the, it's God's message. Do we carry it out? All of them from the greatest to the least. We talked about that earlier, that a fast was proclaimed. And what does it mean to fast? What does it mean to fast? What, anybody, what does it mean to fast? A sacrifice, yeah? From what? Nourishment. Nourishment yeah. but, 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 but could it be just daily lives? From the things that we've created, idols to ourselves, Right? Just things that we like along the way, the way we like our coffee, the way we like our breakfast, the way we like to, to go and watch our favorite movie. He sacrificed all these things to deliver a message. And so fasting, when I think about fasting, I, I, I like to, to, to look at Christ. And, and what was so interesting about Christ, you know, he didn't come down and he wasn't like, hey, I'm Jesus, I'm God, and guess what? You're wrong. <laughs> guess what? You know, none of this really affects me. None of this affects me. Sin doesn't affect me because I'm God. But actually, no, he was fully God and he was fully man. Actually, that he did get tempted. And so guess what he had to do? He had to go fast. He had to go, he said, it said Jesus went into the forest and he fasted. What does that mean? We see that on, on movies, right? And he's praying and praying. Then he goes in and he goes to tell the disciples, take me to the city. I have the news to tell the people. And then what did Jesus do? He went to pray and fast. Back and forth, back and forth, praying and fasting, praying and fasting, giving the word of God. And why did he have to fast? Possibly because if he didn't fast and didn't connect himself to the Father head, the Godhead, could he have possibly given his own message, done his own thing, did it his way, tarnished the message, changed the message, but the message wasn't his to give. I have come on behalf of the Father. It's not his message. It's his. It's not. You, you get where I'm going with this? So you have to stay away from things. And I'm not, it doesn't have to be so extreme. I'm not saying that we all have to starve ourselves and fast every day. But what are the things that are keeping us away from the true word of God as we walk as Christians every day? Not our message, not what we learned in, in school, not what we learned from our friends, not from Bible study, but what does the Word of God have to say? Chapter 3, our, our, the message, point number 3, it is God's message. Do we change it or do we water it down? When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued to Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sack sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent, and with compassion, turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may re relent. Everyone. Not people just in church. Not people just, you know, the, the, the people sinning. Each one of us need to turn away from anything we're doing in our lives that would keep us away from God and all of the things that he has prepared for us.
What could keep us away from God? What can keep us going on mission? What can keep us from being a good citizen? Bitterness, jiltedness about life, the hand that, that life has given us, right? That's, I can speak for myself. Gosh, I'm 44 years old, and I'm barely preaching now. Why, God? It's my question to you, son. You choose. My blessing stays the same. My anointing on your life stays the same. It's you who changes. It's you who does not hear me. It's you who does you don't fast. You're addicted to the things of the world and you can't hear me. You see the world with your glasses on, you don't see him with mine. You don't see the things that I do, and I've told you you're not holy because I'm holy. But if you separate yourself, right, sanctify yourself, I will anoint your steps along the way if you do the work I have given you. And so the message Jonah ran from was not about Jonah at all. The message that I've ran from is not about me at all. It's about God. And God will anoint us, right? What does that mean? He'll give us the provisions, everything we need to carry out, not Mario's work, not Pastor Jeff's work, not River Church's work, not Jonah's work. Whose work? God's work. And why? Why is God's work so important? Is it greater than all the things, our football games, our our music? Because he proclaims that, guess what? This is what he proclaims. I was praying in... in, uh, I started thinking about Ezekiel 33. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, when I bring the sword against the land and the people of the land choose one of their men and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming against the land and blows the trumpet to warn the people, then if anyone hears the trumpet but does not heed the warnings of the sword, comes and takes their life, their blood will be on their own head. Since they heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not heed the warning, their blood will be on their own head. If they heeded the warning, they would have saved themselves. But the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people, and the sword comes and takes someone's life, that person's life will be taken because of their sin but I will hold the watchman watchman accountable for their blood. I will hold the watchman accountable for their blood. Could Jonah have been a watchman? Was he a trumpet? Hey, what's going to happen? You guys got to, don't shoot the messenger, right? We don't like your message, Jonah. That's not really happy. We just want to be happy. That's not a happy message. You say you're going to destroy our city? See Santa Rosa, California? Wow. Here one day, gone the next. Doesn't that look a lot like this? Well, that's totally different. That's not biblical, really. That's just a natural disaster. Is it? I don't know. But I know what the word says. That he will come like a thief in the night. Right? And everything that we hold of value, he will take away. And why does he do this? Why does God do this? If we go to Second uh, Luke chapter 10. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs amongst wolves, among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. All of these messages in the Bible, 
so, about this coming destruction. Now, I know, and I'm the same, I, I like to look at the glass half full. I don't want to look at the glass half empty. I like to be positive, like, man, that's a great day. Let's go for a run. I'm just optimistic by nature. But could we sometimes be so overly optimistic in ourselves that we think that we're good with God? I mean, I don't know. I'm not a perfect human being. I have to work on my things every day. But when I see what Ezekiel 33 says, and I see what Luke says, this fear that, that is put into me like, is more so like an audit of what, I, what am I doing in my own life that would keep me from God's best for the message and the anointing that he has on my life. You know, I, I don't know many of you, and I don't know what you do for a living. I don't know what you go through every day, but I can tell you this with all of my heart and soul, that God loves you very much. He loves you very, very, very much. You have done absolutely nothing in the world that he wouldn't forgive you or me from. However, he is a holy God. Prostitutes running, Israelite men chasing her with rocks. We know this, right, in the Bible? Wanting to stone her. She hides behind Christ. He draws the line. He who has no sin casts the first stone. All the stones drop, right? Turns to the prostitute, your faith has healed you. Sin no more. He didn't condone the sin in the prostitute. And he saved her. But he said, sin no more. There's this pattern of Christ forgiving us, or the Lord forgiving us. Because it obviously is keeping us away from what? Something that's going to happen. This new place that he's going to create. So the message that he gave Jonah, it wasn't about Jonah at all. He chased Jonah down because God's message was very important. So he had to show Jonah, you got to get on track because i got to tell the people that I'm going to bring destruction against their town. Point number four in your notes, it says, God is patient. And God is a God of mercy and second chances. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring them on and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. It was in their faith. Your faith has healed you, but sin no more. It's in our faith. It's in our faith that your faith will move, move mountains. It's as small as a mustard seed. In 2 Peter 3 but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with the roar. The elements will be destroyed by, destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, the day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the, out, and the elements will mount in heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. He's chasing us down because he's telling us that I'm going to create a new place. That this is not your home. This is not your home. This is not your home. There's a video that I, I want to play that Jen sent to me, and uh, I didn't know how I was going to put it in the message today. And, and, and I, you know, see, woo, let me, I was going to say this. I apologize that the message wasn't so happy, but isn't that what we do with the message? Isn't that what we do with the message sometimes? But is it the message in the depth and in the realism in the message for us? Or is it for somebody to turn from their ways? So they could also enjoy this new place, this new heaven. And that's love, isn't it? Isn't that love? Or is it really about ourselves? Well, I really just want them to like me. You know, do you, do you like me? You know, you do a great word. I really like what you do. Or do you understand 
the significance of, of, of the things and the things that are at hand. We're all living today. We know what's going on in the world. Regardless of your politics, regardless of who you voted for, regardless of, of what football team you like, we know something's going on today. And my question to you is this. Are you a citizen of this place? Are you a citizen of this earth? Are you a citizen of heaven? The Lord said to the disciples, as the Pharisees and the Sadducees were trying to, to you know, test him and trip him up, hey, should these guys pay taxes? Should these guys pay taxes? You know, because surely if you're the king and you can say decrees, should they pay taxes? And it reminds me of a lot of what's going on today. And what the Lord said was so awesome. He said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, but render to God what is God's. Don't get me caught up in what you're doing. Don't get me caught up in what you're doing. I came to love every human being. I came here to love every soul. In fact, God was not an American. God was not, a, you get where I'm going with this? He, he is not a human being. He came in flesh form. And so for us, yes, we have to be productive. Yes, we have to, to create a society right now. We have to build something so we, we fight for. But do we fight so much that we actually fight our way out of God's will? The message is not out of to draw us to fear. First Corinthians 2 and 9 says, However as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Amen. And that's why the message has to stay the same. Because he loves us so, so much. He is a good, good, good father. As we worship this last song together, just, just pray for our world. Pray for people who need the Lord. And remember, like when we go out every day and we represent Christ, it's not about representing a Christian. It's not about creating a lifestyle that's based on our ideals. It's about giving a message to people so they too can be saved, so they too can be rescued, so they too have a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, how many chances it takes for them to turn from their ways. I needed it, and I'm here today. Hopefully I stay here today, right? Amen, amen. As we sing this last song, just uh, the altar is open. I want to thank so much, Jeff, for letting me preach today. I was scared to death, but I tell you what, the Lord is good.